guys welcome back to my channel we are just going to jump right in so today's video is about Richard Trenton Chase also known as the vampire of Sacramento all of his crimes happened in the late 70s and I was a little girl at the time yes y'all I never heard anything about his crimes till I started researching the case so let's just dive right in so Richard Trenton Chase was born in Santa Clara County May 25th 1950 he was a killer a rapist, a cannibal, and necrophilia, is that how you say it? Who killed six people in Sacramento County between 1977 and 1978. So his parents were Richard Chase Sr., a computer specialist, and Beatrice Chase, and she was a teacher. Richard was an average boy, nothing special, nothing peculiar. When he was three years old, his family moved into a house in Sacramento. And for those of you that don't know, Sacramento, California is my home. Well, when I started researching the case, I'd never heard about this. And I'm like, it sounds interesting. So that's why I wanted to cover it today. So after they moved into their house in Sacramento, a year later after that, his sister Pamela was born. Now he was a Cub Scout. He played baseball. And he was even well liked by his teachers who thought he was a sweet child. And he was popular with his peers. Now on the surface, the family seemed like any other family. However, behind closed doors, it was a different story, y'all. His parents were strict disciplinarians and nothing's wrong with that but long as you don't take it to the extreme I was part of the spare the rod spoil the child generation and I got spanked but I didn't get beat so there's a difference at age two he was force fed by his father till he vomited he would get thrown up against the wall and he was also emotionally abused now his father Richard senior was extremely violent against Richard Richard for some reason was always the target of his father's mood swings so y'all he had a pretty rough childhood not that that's going to excuse any of the things that he did but I see where it come from it's no excuse but I see it. Now Richard Sr. had difficulty managing his finances. He was an alcoholic and he used drugs. Richard Sr. and Beatrice, his wife, were constantly fighting, usually in the presence of the children. When Richard was 10, he developed Richard Jr. He developed an interest towards dead animals. He started to kill and torture cats, which we all know that's a telltale sign of something's going on. And he was fascinated by the blood inside of these cats. Now it started with cats, but then he began killing killing birds, rabbits, and dogs. At one point, the neighborhood started to notice the disappearance of the stray cats in the neighborhood, and his mom found the cats buried in her flower garden. He also liked to play with matches and would often set small fires. He was surprisingly social in high school. He had no trouble fitting in, he kept himself well-groomed, and he was popular. He even had girlfriends, but in spite of all this, he could not maintain any of these relationships. He was attracted to girls, but when it came down to doing a deed, well, he couldn't keep it manly enough to follow through. Y'all know what I'm saying. And he even had girls break up with him over this. So he started seeing a psychiatrist, psychologist, psychiatrist. He told Richard he was having those issues because he was mentally ill and that he had pent up rage. Richard was humiliated by what the doctor had told him and he didn't process it very well at all. So he pretty much made up his own diagnosis and never returned. So in Richard's mind, his lack of being able to function in the bedroom came from a lack of blood in his body. So to fix this, he thought, why not consume the blood of the animals? So he also began to party and to use a lot of drugs. At 15, he had his first run in with the law for possession of marijuana. Now Richard Sr., his father, got nerved to be disappointed in Richard Jr. because when this happened, I guess he was part of the do as I say, not as I do parenting, but he was upset with Richard because he got in trouble. Now for this possession charge, the judge ordered him to do community service. So pretty much a slap on the wrist. After this, he continued to party and use drugs. His grades started to slip, but he did manage to graduate from Mira Loma High School in June of 1968. So in spite of all this, his parents did buy him a car for his graduation. Not important, but I just thought I'd throw that in there. So Richard got older and he continued to suffer quietly with his manly functions in the bedroom. He grew his hair long. He began to neglect his hygiene, making him always look disheveled. I mean, he looked a mess, y'all. He started to live in filth and withdraw more and more from his friends and they stopped coming by so it was the 60s and this look was in so his mother didn't think anything of it 
probably just thought it's a fad it's a phase you know that he's going through all their kids are looking like hippies so you know Richard's looking like a hippie as well so she didn't believe that his appearance was the result of any kind of problem although his father was worried so in spite of his looks he was able to get a job as a typist and he was even able to hold it down for a while he even enrolled at American River College which y'all I went to American River College for a short time out of high school and it's just weird knowing that this guy was there not when I was there of course but y'all yeah I know the names of the streets and everything in this story so kind of weird so although his mother had never abused him like his father did Richard for some reason became fearful of his mother he thought that his mother was trying to kill him with poison after confronting his mother numerous of times and remember, he had already graduated from high school, so he was just at home causing trouble. His father thought it was time for him to move out. He was like, dude, bro, you gotta go. So his father paid his rent in the apartment so he could move out. Now Richard was on his own, and no one was there to supervise him for what he was about to do. He started to have a hard time socializing. He didn't have very many friends at this point, because remember they all had left because he was being a little weird and they were like, peace out. He had no romantic relationships, so he spent most of his time alone. Now this is when he started to capture, kill, and disembowel animals. And y'all, he would eat them raw. Just basic today, basic iced coffee. So he thought that his heart was shrinking and he thought that if it shrank too much, he would disappear and then he would die. So what did he do? He thought the most logical thing for this not to happen was to blend the animals up in a smoothie form. And he thought this would stop the process of his heart from shrinking. So he would blend them up raw or mix them with Coke, which the drink not the drug. So then of course his body started to react to this because we're not meant to swallow blood whether it's human blood or animal blood no blood no kind of blood we have blood in our body but we're not we're not designed to digest it so in 1976 he was hospitalized for blood poisoning y'all what brought him into the hospital this man injected himself with rabbit blood so two days into his hospital stay Richard left he was like, I'm gone. But when they finally found him, they sent him to a nearby mental facility and the nurses there were so afraid of him, rightfully so. I would be too. So that's where he got his name from because of his vampire-like tendencies. They nicknamed him Dracula. Now in the hospital, he was frequently found with blood on him. Like, bro, you're in the hospital. Where are you getting this blood from? When the nurses would ask him, where did this blood come from? He would say, oh, I cut myself shady. But come to find out later that when the hospital staff wasn't looking, he would capture birds through his window and kill them and drink their blood. After a while, he was able for some reason, I don't know how, was able to convince the hospital that he was okay and that he was capable of taking care of himself again as long as he was on his meds. And the doctor, y'all, big fail, but the doctor said he was no longer a threat to himself or others. Big mistake, huge. But it doesn't end there, otherwise I wouldn't be telling this story. So they released him to his parents. Now his mom, she was in denial. She thought that he didn't have any use for the meds that the doctor gave him. And she actually helped Richard wean himself from his drugs that he should have been taking every day. So many parents are in denial of their bad kids. So then his parents decided that once again, that he needs to be on his own because they didn't want him at their house. They put him up in another apartment and they paid for everything just to keep him out of their house. So once again, he is on his own, off his meds and back to his old ways. Killing rabbits, dogs, neighborhood cats. So now this time, instead of just stray animals that he found in the neighborhood, he started to kill the neighbor's personal pets, like their dogs. And then of course he would kill them and drink their blood. Now this dude, y'all, he was sick. He definitely needed to be on his meds. But of course we know people who kill animals and who can hurt an animal, they eventually move on to something bigger human. Otherwise, like I said, I wouldn't be telling this story. So now remember, Richard looked like a hippie, but then it started to get worse. He stopped bathing and brushing his teeth. He stopped eating, except when he would consume the blood of the animals that he killed. He lost a significant amount of weight very quickly. And I want to lose weight, y'all, but I ain't going that route. And his family wasn't even concerned about all this, not even his mother. One time he showed up to his parents' house holding a dead, bloody animal. His mother didn't even react. She had to have been more than in denial because I don't know but one of my kids show up to my door with a dead animal and blood all over um I need to know the backstory but she just shut the door on him 
like I'm not even gonna deal with this goodbye so let's fast forward to 1977 the police found Richard's truck in Nevada they thought he was in the trunk asleep or just in the trunk I don't know why they heard screaming like off to the side and when they went to see about it they found Richard in the sand completely naked and covered in blood but it wasn't his blood they found a bucket of blood from a cow in his truck along with guns and clothes. Now he told the police that the blood was his and that it leaked out of him. Now you would think the police would have brought him in, called the mental hospital or something, right? No, they just filed the report and let him go. Now by December of 1977, his thirst for blood grew beyond an animal. He wanted a human victim. Now Ambrose Griffin and his wife were bringing groceries into the house and I could not find a picture of him otherwise I would have it up here. But they were in East Sacramento. Every time I say these things like this is like wow I know I know where it is. But little did they know that as they were bringing the groceries into the house that Richard was parked and watching them. So Ambrose was 51 at the time. He was an engineer and a father of two. So as he was unloading the groceries Richard pulled up in front of his house. Richard shot Ambrose, killing him instantly. Then Richard took off. The police didn't have any suspects. Richard wasn't even on their radar. Richard called this his warm-up murder because he was itching for more. So then he started going around trying to break in people's houses. He would try the door, y'all, and if it was locked to him, that was a sign that he wasn't welcome. But if it was unlocked, that was an invitation for him to walk right on in. He went into his neighborhood of all places, checking doors. So as he was walking, he came across a girl he went to high school with. Her name was Nancy Holden. She was shocked by his appearance because remember in high school, he was popular. He asked her for a ride and Nancy was like, uh, no bro, not today. And then she went on her way. Now don't forget about Nancy Holden because she's gonna come back up later on in the story. So one of these times where he was roaming the neighborhood, you know, looking for houses to go in, a family had just left to run errands. They left their door unlocked, which I guess that was something people used to do a long time ago. I've heard about people not locking their doors because they didn't think anything would happen. So this family left and left their doors unlocked. So Richard tried the door handle, it was unlocked. He waltzed right on in. He started stealing things. He urinated in one of the drawers in the kid's room and he even defecated in the baby's bed. As Richard was leaving, the family came back home. So when the husband seen him, he like bomb rushed him and they were fighting. Richard managed to get up and escape. Another time as he was canvassing the neighborhood. He came up on the house of David and Teresa Wallen. They were a young married couple and Teresa was even pregnant. So Richard came up on the house, he tried the door, it was unlocked and he walked in. David wasn't there, it was just Teresa. He immediately shot her and brought her to the bedroom and y'all, he assaulted her post-mortem. He then stabbed her and removed her organs. He collected her blood in a bucket to save for later and he used it to bathe in. He also drank her blood and y'all, this is gross, but he put dog poop in her mouth. So again, another time he's walking the neighborhood trying to find a house to break into and he came to the home of Evelyn Maroth. I think it's Maroth. She was home at the time babysitting her 22 month old nephew, David Ferreira, and her six year old son, Joshua. He was there as well. Then a friend of Evelyn, Danny Meredith, Meredith, Danny Meredith came by the visit. Evelyn asked Danny to keep an eye on her children. She sees the opportunity because you know how when you're watching kids you have to focus on them but she wanted to take a bath. She wanted to get clean so she asked him to keep an eye on the children while she took a bath and he said yes. So she got in the bath and Danny went walking down the hall. He seen Richard. Richard shot him and killed him instantly and he stole his wallet and his keys and y'all it gets worse. It gets worse. Evelyn's six-year-old son, he seen this and he ran into his mom's room where Richard shot him twice in the head. Then Richard shot the baby, Evelyn's 22-month-old nephew that she was watching for the day. So all this happened within seconds. Evelyn heard the noise and she was rushing to get out of the bathroom to see what was going on. But before she could make it out, he came in and shot her. He then brought her into her own bedroom, assaulted her lifeless body and began drinking her blood. And if you didn't guess by now, he was able to keep it manly and follow through because of his fascination with blood. So while he was doing the deed with her lifeless body, there was a knock at the door. A six-year-old neighbor, she came to play with Evelyn's son because the moms had arranged a play date. So Richard panicked and left in Danny's car and took his body with him. The girl told her parents, who then called the police. They found perfect handprints and footprints 
in blood all over. The police then started to come up with a profile for how the killer would look. Now, five days after those murders, remember Nancy Holden, his friend from high school? I told y'all she would come back up. She heard the police report and read the profile that the investigators came up with. She felt so strongly in her heart that this was Richard. So she contacted the police and told him why she thought this was him. The police took her seriously, did a background check on Richard. Thank God and they found that he had a 22 caliber pistol that was registered to him. The same weapon that was used in all the murders. Now they started to tie it all together. They went and they arrested Richard at his home. When they went in, y'all, it was blood everywhere. On the walls, on the floors, on his refrigerator, on his utensils. It was everywhere. But Richard lied to the police and said, oh, I just killed some dogs. But they found Danny's wallet in his possession. Y'all, this apartment must have been so funky because the cops found coagulated blood, rotting internal organs, animal body parts. He had a human brain in a container in the fridge, which they assumed was Danny's. And then they found Teresa and Evelyn's organs. So the police finally knew that they caught the vampire of Sacramento. In 1979, he pled not guilty for reasons of insanity. And he was insane, but he was guilty. But they found him guilty of all six counts of murder. But they said he was legally sane, that he knew what he was doing. But he had to have been a little cuckoo because y'all. Yeah. He was sentenced to be executed by the gas chamber. So in prison, they prescribed him medication for his mental issues, which he should have been on his whole life. I mean, I don't know that if his mom would have not weaned him off of it, that he would have continued to be on it on his own. I don't know. So apparently they wasn't watching him well enough or didn't make sure that he took his medicine because even though they gave it to him, he wasn't taking it. He was hiding it. He was only pretending to take it. So he waited till he got enough to take his life. And on December 26, 1979, Richard was found dead in his cell. He had OD'd from his medication in San Quentin State Prison. Y'all, what do y'all think about this? Have you ever heard about this before? The vampire of Sacramento? I mean, he was considered a serial killer, not as big or huge as some of the other ones, but still a serial killer. I had never heard about it before. That's why I found it interesting and wanted to cover it because it is here in Sacramento where I live. And he went to the college I went to. And I don't know, I just found it interesting and fascinating, but quite disturbing. So y'all, yeah, tell me what you think. There's so many people that failed him in his life. And yeah, I know a lot of people can have a hard life and not turn out to be murderers. I get that. And so I'm not trying to excuse him of his actions. But at the same time, I understand why he was that way because when he tried to get help, people failed him, the psychiatrist. And even though he didn't understand what was going on or what the, why the psychologist, psychiatrist said that, yeah. And even when he was in the mental hospital the first time, they put him on medication, which could have easily helped him had his mom not got him off of it. There's so many mothers that protect their kids, their sons mainly, when they're not a great person. Give me more ideas of things you want me to cover. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next video.